just lift our Bible up this morning. Father, I thank you as I get to stand again and preach your word today, Father. And Lord, I thank you for Journey Church, Lord, and we pray for all those that are sick and afflicted, Lord. Lord, we know there's babies being born, babies about to be born, God. And Lord, I, I continue to want to lift up uh, uh, young Phoenix to you, Lord, that she is healed in the name of Jesus, God. And Pastor Sawyer and their family, God, that you would just give them strength and encouragement, Lord. And Father, we just want to come to your word. We, wanna, we are going to be encouraged. We're going to be uplifted. We are going to be different from when we walked in here. Not because of who we are, but because of who you and your word are this morning, Father. Everybody say, that's my God. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Well, as you know, we've been in a series called, everybody say, Culture. We've been in a series called Culture for the last three weeks. Today is the third and, and final uh, message on culture. Uh, however, I want to encourage you right now to take out your card, your connection card. I want you to go ahead. I want to get ahead of this thing today because I got a feeling at the end there's going to be, I don't know, just, I just got a feeling, okay? Uh, <laughs> look at your neighbor and say, he got a feeling. Got a feeling. All right, just, I got a feeling, so just go with it, okay? I want you to go ahead and fill out your prayer request, okay? And get it ready for the end of the service to drop in the basket. Now, this is for everybody. I'd, like, I'd love to see every single person in here say, you know what? I, I tell you what, I still need prayer. Amen? Yeah. I need prayer for encouragement and strength and sleep. <laughs> I just decided sleep is just a, 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 it ain't even there. I don't care. Anyway, but, but we all need something we can pray about. So I want you to write that down on the card while we're doing this right here right now before we get to preaching this morning. And go ahead and get ready to put that in, the, in, the, in the, when, at the end of the service when we take up the tithes and offerings at the end. And drop that in there because Wednesday nights are being so powerful with praying over these cards. Amen? Amen? Amen. And so it, it gives us another point to pray for you, to connect with you in prayer. But, but how many know that, that culture, and, and Pastor Chris did a phenomenal job, and, 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 and I, for one, got to watch a Journey Church service at the hospital via live stream. So we want to welcome our live stream campus this morning and those watching. Come on, let's give them a hand. Amen. That, that thing is very important if you're not able to be here. I, I recognize that. So wonderful message last week on culture. And today I want to talk to you about more culture. And, uh, but out of the prayer cards, I mean, that's where I was going. Out of the prayer cards that the last time I was here we took up, I had you say anything you want to pray for. I said, whether it be your family, your marriage, your, your kids, whatever. And I tell you, I, I got probably around 35, 40 cards maybe. And let me tell you something. Out of all the cards, the majority of them was, Pray for my marriage and family. Pray for my marriage. Man, I'm like, wow, we've got marriages that are under attack. How many are married? Your marriage is under attack. You say, may say, well, it's good right now. Well, it hadn't always been good, and it probably, if you don't keep ahead of that thing, it ain't going to be good all the time. And so I'm excited. I'm probably, I'm more encouraged now to, to next month go into a marriage, a marriage type series dealing with some of this stuff. So, be ready for maybe the Culture of Marriage series next month, okay? But anyway, uh, so we're going to pray a lot for marriages here in the next few weeks. But how many know that today, everybody say culture, and we learned in week one, culture is, is not you, a culture is a group of people and what that group of people believes. It's the belief of a group of people, amen? If you take and go overseas, there's different cultures that you operate in. I like the culture where us men, if you don't belch after a meal, it's an insult to the cook. Now in our culture, if you belch at a meal, it's like rude and, 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 and inconsiderate. Amen. But seriously, there are cultures that you go to where after you eat, if there's not some kind of belching or we call it burping, then it's an insult to the cook that the meal wasn't good. I like that culture. Amen. Us men, we want to help get that culture in America. Amen. But anyway, so there's a lot of different cultures, but it takes a group of people to make up a culture. Now, and back from week one, I'm just kind of recapping from week one, how many know what the number one force is to shape culture? The number one thing that shapes any culture is what it values. It's the value. What do you value? What's your core values? That in itself is what, so in other words, what you value produces what you do and how you act. So if you value the right things, you'll have the right culture. If you value wrong things, you'll have what kind of culture? Or, come on, say it with me. Say a wrong culture. Amen? Amen? And as individuals, now let's get back into the individual person. As an individual, my culture was not just poof, it was there. My culture came from the way I was raised and the environment I surrounded myself with and what got put into me developed the culture that I operate in. Amen? Would you say amen to that? How many know if it goes for me, it goes for you? Yeah. The culture you're operating in 
it, it's a whole lot of different things in your life that have come together to give you the way you process thoughts, the way you process responding to things, and how you do life. That has been your culture. You may want to call it your influence, the people that influenced you. You I mean, you find society now, there's all kinds of cultures even within our own just backyard, seems like. How I many know if you grew up in a family where it was all pity and low self-esteem and feel sorry for me and entitlement, that's your culture. That's what you grew up in. How I many know we're seeing a big culture of that? There are other people, you grew up, you're, you're very influential, you're strong-willed, you're, you, you have a lot of self-approval in yourself, you're, you're, not, you're not scared of anything. That's the culture you were surrounded with mostly, amen? amen? And so we're a product of what people valued in the culture we grew up in. Now, when it comes to church, how many know we got a lot of culture over here? We got a lot of different culture right here. We got a lot of different culture in this section, and we got a lot of different culture in this section. But how many know all these four quadrants of our church make up the culture of Journey Church? Yeah. Amen? And a chain is only as good as what? The weakest link in there. You can have the most strongest links, but if you have one weak culture, it affects the whole bunch. Amen? Come on, somebody. Touch your neighbor and say, he ain't talking to me, though. <laughs> Amen? So, so let me ask you this. If you could choose, what kind of culture would you want to be? How many of you want to be a low self-esteem, just depressed, blame game, pity party, can't, it's everybody else's fault? How many want that culture? Raise your hand. Come on, raise your hand, bold and proud. You want to live that way? You want to reflect that in your life? You hope your kids grow up in that stuff too? Raise your hand. Come on. Anybody? No. But how many of you may live a little bit in that culture? All you got to do to look at somebody's culture nowadays is, a, is how they act. If you act that way, then that's your culture. Now, you may not like it because I'm saying it, but it doesn't change the fact that if your actions back that up, then that's the culture you've got. That's the culture you were probably raised up in. But there's got to come a point in time where you've got to say, you know what? If God is the big God of the Bible, the God of all the universe, he's big enough to change my culture. Yeah. Amen. He is that big. How many of you today would say, I want to grow up in a culture, and I just use two words for this, I want to grow up and be a culture of excellence and honor. How many of you want to be that culture? How many of you want your kids to grow up in that culture? Then guess what? If you want to be that, and you want your kids to grow up in that culture, and you want Journey Church to be that culture, then you have to become that culture yourself. You can't say, I want to be a part of that. You've got to be the living organism inside this thing that brings life to it. You've got to breathe the culture of Jesus, which was excellence and honor. Amen? How many know that Jesus Christ walked in an excellent and honorable culture his whole life? Yeah. Amen? And, and I think I, I heard this the other day, and I loved it, and I wrote it down. I don't know if I can say it right, but it's like this. Jesus didn't respond to the devil. Jesus responded to God the Father. Amen? Or excuse me, Jesus didn't react to the devil's plots. He responded to God the Father's will. That's how he stayed in excellence and honor. But today's society, we run around trying to react to everything the devil's doing to us, trying to figure it all out, doing this, that, and the other. And I can't tell you, I battled that at the hospital. Our surgery was the 10th, whenever that was. I don't even know what day it is today, I'll be honest with you. It's just all been a big blur. And we're in there. We were supposed to get out of the hospital last Saturday. Then Sunday rolls around. We're out Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And man, by about Tuesday, Wednesday, I'm like, what is going on, God? Why are we still here? And then I thought, uh-huh, somebody must need to get saved. So I started nailing every person walked into our room. I mean, they wouldn't even get a breath in to say their name. I'd hear that door pop, poop. Hey, let me ask you a question right quick. I don't even know who you are. Do you know Jesus Christ? <laughs> yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. Why? I don't know why, I don't know why we're here, but if it's because a lost person, we got to get them saved. I'm getting whoever's saved coming through that door. We're getting, we getting out of here. <laughs> All right? Because I want this culture of excellence and honor, <laughs> and I want out of this place, Okay. And so, but and I'm all, and I'll ask all of every single person that come in our room profess knowing Jesus Christ. I can guarantee you that because they were all got hammered as soon as they come. I'm like, I am not going to be a stumbling block to God's will to get me out of here. If that's the case, somebody's getting saved at the hospital. All right. So, and then I went out when I went the few, few times that my daughter would let me out of the room, 
I would pray down the hall over every kid in those rooms, man. I'm like, salvation, glory, honor, healing, you know. And I'm, I'm praying in the Holy Ghost going down the hallways, you know. And, but anyway, I don't care. I want the excellence and honor of God, not the reputation of man. Amen? And so, everybody say excellence. excellence. Now, we've all confessed we want to live and we want to operate in excellence and honor. I mean, no, that's not going to happen. Culture does not happen by accident. It has to be a process, a plan that you go to and you see and you go after and you adjust your life to the culture. The culture does not adjust you. Amen? Everybody say excellence. Three of the definitions of the word excellence, you may want to write this down. It means exceptional. It means outstanding. And yes, the word honorable is there. Exceptional, outstanding, honorable. It's traits that you're not seeing in a lot of people's lives, even inside the house of God anymore. But my friends, I'm telling you, it's what Jesus was, it's who he is, and if we got his DNA running inside of us, it is who we have to be. We have to learn to operate in the culture of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Why do we call ourselves his if we don't act like him? Why do we call ourselves we belong to Jesus, but yet we don't talk like him, we don't respond like him, we don't even think like him anymore? We've got to get our culture, our mind, our heart, our mouth, our ears, everything about us lined back up to who Jesus is and the culture he operated in. Amen? Amen. Now, how many know that today's church and today's culture and today's society, they have three main statements that we hear. (laughs) They're going to do the least they can do to get by, not the best, the least. What's the least I can do and just get by by the skin of my teeth? That's the number one thing we hear, big, big movement today. And there's very little to absolutely almost zero respect for other people and their property and things of that nature in today's time. And then the last thing we hear out of this culture is somebody owes me. The entitlement mentality. It's your fault. Somebody owes me. You owe me something. I don't want to have to do nothing to get anything. I mean, no, that is the, that, that's the culture of the pits of hell. Yeah. Amen. That is a culture that will bring a society down faster than anything. That is a culture that brings destruction into marriages, relationships, families, churches. Whatever that type of culture touches, it always destroys it and makes a mess of it. Come on, can I say an amen there? That's why we must operate in an excellent spirit. Now, some people say, we talk about an excellent spirit. Is there such a thing as actual a spirit of excellence? And the answer is absolutely yes. And we're going to turn over to the book of, the book of Daniel this morning in chapter 6. Don't put it up yet. But Daniel operated his life out of a spirit of excellence. Now, how many know that there, 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 there's a spirit of laughter? There's, there's a lot of different spirits, all of God's spirit. Amen? Amen. There, there's a spirit of salvation. How many know there's a baptism of the Holy Spirit? Amen? Amen. But how many know that, that, that automatically you just don't get every spirit? You have to seek the things of God. Amen? Amen. The Bible says those who diligently seek after him, he, he, is a, he rewards them for their diligent seeking. Amen? So when you seek after God, you're going to get God. A lot of people have this big fear. What if I seek after God and I get something that's not God? <laughs> well, the Bible plainly says in, in the Scriptures in the New Testament, if, if we being good fathers know how to give good gift to our kids, how much more will the, the Father above give us the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Yeah. He said, if you ask for, for, for bread, I'm not going to give you a scorpion. Okay? So God's always going to give you of Himself. He's never going to give you something that's not of Him. Does that make sense? So we don't have to be afraid of any of the spirit. If the spirits are of God, we don't have to be afraid of them. We should be embracing them. Amen? Amen? But it's not automatic. How I many you know there's a lot of Christians walking the face of the earth today, but there's a lot of Christians who are saved, salvation's in them, they're going to heaven, but they don't have a spirit of excellence because they've never sought that spirit out. Yeah. Amen. Amen? So Daniel has here, uh, he operates in this what we call the spirit of excellence. Now, if you read in chapter 5, Belshazzar is king here. There's a writing on the wall that comes forth, and he calls in all the soothsayers and the and astrologers. None of them can interpret it. Then, then one of the maidens steps up and says, hey, there's a man in the, in, the, in the house here. He can interpret. He's a man of God. He's filled with God's spirit. He calls him in. He interprets the dream, the writing on the wall. It's not real good for King Belshazzar, okay? And, he, and in other words, in a few weeks and a month, he kicks the bucket. He's gone. He's out of the way. Amen. But we get in chapter 6, now there's a new king, King Darius is there. He knows of Daniel's excellence. He knows of him being a man of God, walking with excellence and honor in all that he does. And Darius wants to tap into the the, the properties that that Daniel's operating in, that excellence and honor, and give him some position. Amen? So if you would go with me right now to Daniel chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, it says this. It says in verse 1, it says, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps. To be over the whole kingdom. In other words, he divided the kingdom into 120 provinces. They call them satraps here. 
governments, different, you know, all under one court, kind of like the, there's 50 states in the United States of America, amen? On, on the mainland anyway. Hallelujah. Verse 7, and over these three governors, we're going to rule all these 120 territories, of whom Daniel was one that the satraps might give account to them so that the king would not suffer no loss. So you understand in this, Darius comes in, he's a pretty wise guy. He says, this is a large kingdom. I'm going to have 120 different provinces, and oh, I'm going to divide it up. So basically, each governor, which, which Daniel became one of, had 40 sections under each one of them. And Daniel had 40 under him. Amen? Are you getting the picture? All right. Here's my favorite verse. Verse 3. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because, and say it with me. Come on, read the scriptures. Because, and say it with me, excellent spirit was in him. And the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. So not only did he have favor to be one of the three people out of all the whole governmental system to be set over 40 provinces, but now the king is thinking he is so good. He is so excellent. There's something in him that other guys don't have. I'm thinking about just getting rid of those two and making him over all of it. How many know that when you operate in God's excellence and honor, people, lost people will notice, saved people will notice, everybody's going to notice and want some of you. They're going to want you to be in charge of something. They're going to say, we need a man, we need a woman like this in our congregation. We need a man, we need a woman like this in our corporation who works among us to give us ideas. Come on, somebody. Touch your neighbor and say, hey, why can't that be you? And let me tell you the answer to that. It can be you if you're willing to do what God's called you to do. Amen? So when you're living in excellence and honor, that culture of excellence and honor, it's going, I promise you, it will bring reward with it. You may not see it all the time. We'll talk about that in a minute. But I promise you, there is a reward coming when you operate in excellence and honor. And again, Darius saw it. Don't know that he was completely saved at that time. Apparently not. Apparently wasn't flowing 100% with God. And I'll tell you why in the rest of the chapter here in just a little bit, okay? <laughs> How many know that developing a spirit of excellence, you've got to walk it out? Again, it's not a given thing where it's just bam, all of a sudden, you got to work at it. It's a, everybody's turning to them and say, you got to work at it. Amen? It's a, it, you got to continually walk, not in God's principles, but in God's presence. How many of you know the difference between principles and presence? Most of y'all do, but in case you haven't been here in the last year, the principles of God, you take just the core principles of the Word of God, they will work for anybody. Even lost people, if you live by the principles of God, you're going to have a better life. You may not go to heaven, but you're still going to have a better life here. You're going to have a good family life. You have a good marriage. You're going to be successful to a certain measure. But if you know God and you walk in his presence, there is no failure. Let me say it again. There is no failure in the presence of God. To establish yourself in the excellence and honor of God, you need to walk continually in his presence, not just by his principles. Amen? You've got to have the principles, of course. The principles are a preset to go into the presence. Amen? You can't get to the presence without the principles. But so many Christians get stuck just trying to live in the principles. Amen. Well, I'm just trying to do good. I'm trying not to covet my neighbor's stuff. I'm trying not to kill nobody today. That's a good thing. Amen? But you've got to get to where you're in his presence, and you look to operate in excellence and honor above anything that Satan throws at you. Can I have a better amen? Amen. amen. Hallelujah. If you go with me now real quickly to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7. But the Bible says here, but as you excel in everything. Now, guess what the word excel is the derivative from? Excel comes from the word excellent. So the Bible says, but as you excel in what? Everything. everything. Now, the word everything there means what? Everything. No, it don't. I caught y'all this time. It means, the, the literal meaning is everything. But the spiritual connotation of this as you excel in everything means everything that is good and perfect and from God. So today if you're a practicing sinner and you know you're blatantly defying God, he don't want you to excel in that. He wants you to excel in everything that is of God. Love, mercy, kindness, grace, forgiveness, anointings, prayer, blessings, honor, and glory. He wants you to excel in those things that are of him. So don't, don't think today if you're caught up in a, a sin and you like your sin and you're good at your sin that we want you to excel in sin. No, we want you to excel at getting forgiveness from it and getting delivered and getting over it in the name of Jesus. Amen? But as you excel in everything, and he, he calls that, he says, in your faith, 
in your speech. Oh, somebody come on, say amen there. How many know you need to excel in your speech? And you, if you cuss, you don't need to excel in that. If you gossip, you don't need to excel at that. If, if you tell lies, you do not need to excel at that. You need to excel at having the mouth of Jesus Christ, which was encouragement, praise, and honor, and glory. Amen. And a kind word turns away, turns away some wrath. Amen? Yeah. So excel in your speech. Excel in your knowledge. Amen? Yeah. In all earnestness and in your love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. Amen. Wow. The church would do real good if we would begin to excel in grace. Offering grace to people that maybe never offered it to us. But that's okay if they never offered it to us. If nobody ever offers you grace, it's been offered from God the Father. Amen. So don't let, hit, don't let people stand in the way of you being graceful. You have a graceful God that forgave you of everything you've ever done. Come on, somebody. Look at your neighbor and say, I know he's talking about you now. Amen? How many know this is how to grow up in an awesome culture? This is a culture of excellence. Look what it calls out. Faith, the way we speak, knowing, knowing who Christ is, the earnestness of our heart for love, that we excel in grace. That is a culture right there the Bible calls out for us to walk in, us to breathe in, us to talk in, what we hear, what we see, what we do. It should all represent the full grace of God in our life. Amen? 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 Now, now, what was so cool, another thing that happened back at the surgery, we didn't tell anybody we were pastors. I never throw the pastor card out anywhere I go because I don't want to have to depend on a title for my character. Amen. So the doctor comes in that morning, the, the surgeon comes in, he says, okay, we're going to get you in a little bit, sweetheart, and, and mom, dad, y'all just pray everything goes well. That's all he said. That's all he had to say right then with me. I said, well, hold on, doc, we're going to do that right now over you. So I got to lay hands on my doctor and bless him and pray over him. And, of course, he don't, again, he don't, he don't have a clue. He, I, I'll be honest with you, I still don't know if he knows I'm a pastor or not. But he knows there's a culture in our room and in our family that we believe in the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That's more important than any title I'll ever have. Amen? Amen? See, it's a cultural thing. I don't need a cultural title. I need a cultural action. Amen? If you have to have a title to operate in the culture of Jesus, you're never going to operate in the culture of Jesus. Amen? 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 Hey, look at you there and say, that's how to grow up in an awesome culture. Amen? So here we have the book of Daniel, and we have the church of Corinth. And how many know both of them were operating in a spirit of excellence at this point? But they didn't always operate in a spirit of excellence. There's some things that went on that challenged their excellence. Amen? Daniel, and I'm going to tell you about that just a little bit, what he, what he faced. Okay? I think we all know what he faced. Yeah. <laughs> okay? But the church at Corinth here. If you look at the scripture, what it's telling them, it's encouraging them, it's bringing correction. Because the church at Corinth was still divided a lot. You had Jews and you had Gentiles arguing, still arguing about some old stuff. The church itself was still offering food to false idols. Yeah. And so what Paul is doing here, he's trying to bring them, he's bringing them into, uh, getting them out of the culture of what they grew up in, into the culture of the kingdom of God. Because Jesus Christ has now come. Amen. He's died and he's risen again. And he's got a culture he wants his church to operate in. And he's still doing that today. He wants his church to reflect who he is. His culture, his values, his beliefs. Come on, somebody. Are you with me this morning? Did y'all die when I left? Okay, just checking. Amen? Now, everybody say this word with me. Process. It was through, it's, it's always through a process that a culture of excellence and honors developed. You don't come out of the womb knowing how to operate in excellence and honor. Right. You don't. I don't care how good you are. You didn't come out of the womb knowing how to do that automatically. You had to be brought up into it. It has to be a process. You had to learn, no, you don't do that if you want to be excellent and honor. You don't do that. You do this. No, nope, you don't. You say you're sorry. Is that not what we're doing to our kids right now when they mis misbehave? What are we trying to do? We're trying to get them in a culture of excellence and honor. We've got to try harder. We've got to try harder. Because we're dropping the ball somewhere. Oh, that's, not, that's just cute. That's just, that little bit of rebellion is cute. No, that little bit of rebellion will get them to hell. Right. Amen. Rebellion is never cute at any age. Right. At any age. Amen. <laughs> at any age. Yeah. It's never cute. 
Oh, there's a process to excellence and honor. Oh, that's a good thing. I want to get on here and move from glory to glory and faith to faith. And yes, that, that's part of it. But how many know that along that process, sometimes there's some things you're going to go through to see if you're going to stick with the process? Yeah. Amen. Amen? Like I said, the church of Corinth was saved. They were new baby Christians, but some of them were still offering food to idols. So Paul has to come in here and kind of bring correction to them. Amen. And in the book of Daniel, if you read, if you read the, from verses 1 to 3, it talks about the glory of Daniel and how he got favor. But what you don't understand is when he began to get that favor with King Darius, the other two governors got jealous. They began to get jealous of Daniel because he had something in him, an excellence and honor they didn't have because they didn't have a relationship with God like he did. And so they begin to set out a plot against Daniel. We got to do something. If we don't, if he's going to get all the glory if we don't do something. So they went to King Darius and they, they built him up. Oh, King Darius, there's never been a king like you. You're an awesome king. Why don't you write a king's decree that nothing can be worshipped for 30 days except King Darius? And if anybody worships anything else but King Darius in these 30 days, they will be put to death because you're such a great king. And Darius wasn't thinking right. And he got caught up in the glam. And he got caught up in that culture of, boy, it's all about me. Look how good I am. He became a legend in his own mind right there. Can anybody relate to that or know somebody? But anyway, anyway, he signed a decree, put the insignia of his seal on it, and then lo and behold, the word came to Daniel that if that happened, and you know what Daniel did? He walked right up to his window, opened to the east gates, laid his carpet out, and he prayed to the Almighty God three times a day, knowing the decree that had been set out, knowing what it would cost him if it, he got caught. And it, of course, those guys were waiting in the lanes, and they went to King Darius. Oh, your servant Daniel has defied the king and the king's order. Oh, he's not operating in the culture of the king. He's got to be. And the king's like, well, you know what I did? I signed a decree. It can't be overturned. <laughs> got to put him in the lines then. Got to put him in the lines then. So sometimes operating in the, oh, your culture of excellence and honor can make, get you in the lines then. Not from God, but from those who don't like what you do for Christ. Yeah. Amen. Amen? Amen? Yes, but it's worth it. But here's the cool part, and I ain't got time to preach the whole story to you. King Darius even went to Daniel and said, listen, I believe your God will be with you. Yeah. I believe your God will be with you as you go into the lines then. And if you read the rest of the scriptures in that thing, it said King Darius went that night. He prayed. He fasted. He couldn't sleep all night. Said he got up the next morning, ran down to the place of the arena where they had him. Said, Daniel, you up in there? No, I don't think he actually said that. But anyway, <laughs> something pretty much. Hey, yo, you, you still up in there, bro? <laughs> Daniel called back and said, praise the Lord God Almighty. He's delivered me out of the mouth of the lions. He has shut the lion's mouth. <laughs> Darius rejoiced, got Daniel out, took them two suckers that conned him, put them in there. Read the scripture, put them in there, and the lions all of a sudden were hungry and devoured even their bones, it says. So when you operate in a spirit of excellence and honor, no matter what you go through, God's got your back. Now check this out. Daniel didn't seek revenge on those who put him in there, but God took care of it. So see, when you operate in honor and excellence, you're not about revenge or getting back or, or having to post something stupid because somebody else posted something stupid, stupid. God's got your back. He knows how to handle them. The reason he can't handle them is because you all up in his way. Because you're not operating in his excellence or his honor. He can't do what he wants to do. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. But in the lion's den, in the times when we're maybe offering food to the, to the false idols while we're trying to be saved at the same time, it's a process we have to learn. Without learning, you don't get more knowledge. And what's the one thing he said, I want you to excel in? I want you to excel at knowledge. Sometimes knowledge comes through failing. But God is not talking about a failing where you fall and you lay there and you waller in it. It's a falling that you, you, you hey, you fail. I'm here. Get up. Let's learn. Let's go. Here's what you do to not ever fall in that again. That's the true grace of God. That's the true grace of God when you get an anointing to overcome what you've fallen in before and you don't fall back. That's grace. You touch your neighbor and say, that's real grace. That's real. Amen? Yet in these, often in these times, everybody say if. Yeah. If we respond to the Father and not react to our circumstances, if we respond to God, then we're going to come out of it and we're going to get a reward. Yeah. And Daniel went on to become a mighty ruler. Amen? Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Now, Paul had to lead them through the process, say amen. Yep. Now, if you look at the Word of God, New Testament, the, the, the old, the Bible terminology is called epistles, the epistles of Paul, the epistles, they were letters to the churches. 
Romans, Corinthians, Thessalonians, Philippians, Colossians. Those are all churches and regions where churches were at. And if you look, Paul's writings to the churches at that time were for three main things. And you want to write these down. Paul was constantly bringing them correction. Somebody come on, say that with me. Say correction. He would bring them direction. Say direction. And then he would bring them encouragement. Encur come on, say it with me. Let's say them together. Correction, direction, and then encouragement. Correction, direction, encouragement. Correction, direction, encouragement. That's what every, if you read the Bible, that's what every one of them was. We're bringing correction where it needs to be brought, but we're not going to just correct you and make you mad. We want to give you direction because we love you. This is not what you need to be doing, but this is how Christ does it. This is how a believer does it. You don't offer, you don't offer that food to idols no more. That is gone. They're not real. You carved them. You molded them and made them yourself. Nothing of your hands should ever be worshipped. But they hadn't been taught that. That wasn't their culture. Yeah. And now they're leading them out of that culture. And telling them this is, what, this is what true sons and daughters of God look like. How we talk, how we operate, and how we act. And so they would bring correction. They would bring direction. And then they'd bring encouragement. Hey, you guys can do it. You're doing good. We want to give you praise. We're still praying for you day and night as we hear about your good deeds. Amen? If you look at, and just look at, just go home tonight or sometime this week and read the seven letters to the seven churches in, in Revelations. You'll see correction, direction, encouragement in every one of them. Yep. But most of them start out like this. You know, you see yourself this way, but I see you as this. Yep. He brings correction, direction, and then encouragement. Amen? Amen? So, so how many know if he brought it to the first church, how many know he's still got to bring it to us? Yep. But now everybody say, let's get some truth. We've got a culture today that we only want one of the three things that God brings with excellence and honor. And it ain't correction. God forbid anybody try to correct anybody now. That, who do you think you are telling me about God? I'll do what I want to. Come on, that's the attitude 90% of people have, even Christians. Direction. Who are you to tell me where to go? I done been there and done more than that than you think ever to think of. But I'll take that encouragement. I just want you to encourage me. And you don't even care. A lot of people, really what you want is you want somebody to come agree with your sin. Yeah, that's right. Tell me my sin's okay. Tell me it's not that bad. Tell me I'm going to be all right. Yeah, and when you understand what greasy grace is and hyper grace is, that's a message that will send you straight to hell while well, you feel good about it. Yeah, that's right. Come on, you won't feel bad about going to hell. You'll feel good about going to hell. Mm -hmm. Again, the true grace of God delivers you from sin and sets you free from it. Yeah. It doesn't agree with it. It doesn't say it's okay to do. That's an unpopular message today, I know. But it's the message of the Word of God. Amen. Now, is there grace for when you mess up? Absolutely. Yeah. Is there a covering of your sin? Absolutely, if you call upon the name of the Lord. Repent. Turn from your evil ways. Amen? Amen. Amen. <laughs> correction, direction, and encouragement. So what is correction, direction, and encouragement? It's what I like to call the process. Are you with me? Yeah. Everybody say the process. All right, we're going to move quickly right here. Now, the ones that receive that process, walk through correction, walk through direction, and walk through the encouragement, they are the ones that get rewarded the most. They are the most blessed people that walk on the face of the earth. They're the most happiest, overcoming people. And yes, they're saved just like all the... But there's a lot of saved people. They ain't overcoming nothing. They ain't got no joy. They're getting defeated every time they turn around, but they're saved and they're wondering why. It's because you're not walking out the process of correction, direction, and encouragement. So don't fear that. Heard your neighbor say, don't fear, that. don't fear that. Amen? Real quickly, let's talk about honor. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30 says this, Therefore the Lord God of Israel says, I promise you that the branches of the tribe of Levi would always be my priest. But I will, come on, shout it with me, I will honor those who what? Honor, honor me. And I will despise those who think lightly of me. Strong word from the word of God here. He says, if you honor me, I'll honor you. But if you despise me, then I will esteem you lightly. He doesn't say I'm just going to throw you away. But he says, don't expect to get the full blessings of heaven operating in your life, your marriage, your family, your finances, anything else. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, in that time, he's talking to the Levitical tribe, which is out of the Levites, come the priest of the house. And he's talking to the priest here. But when Jesus came, he says, you're now a royal priesthood to the church. 
So you're of a priesthood. You're made of priests and kings. And so this is not just for the priest today, guys. This transferred to you and me by the blood of Jesus Christ. Come, somebody raise your hand and say, that belongs to me. Can you just stand up just for about five seconds and just give him a quick praise wave or a hand clap and say, it belongs to me, God. Come on, shout. It belongs to me today, God. Hallelujah. Transferred by the blood of Jesus from the Old Testament right here today, 2017, in my life, in my heart, I honor you. Therefore, you're going to honor me. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> Counted quick there, didn't I? Amen. Hallelujah. Honor. One of the first verses that popped into my mind when the word honor comes. What's, can, can somebody guess my favorite verse in the word honor? Anybody? Honor your father, the first commandment. Ten commandments. Somebody say, ten. Ten, ten commandments. The very first one. <laughs> Talks about mom and dad. I are one of those now. Have been for 22 years. Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. And I know what some of you are thinking right now. There ain't nothing you can teach me new about honoring your father and mother. That, that may be well with you and you have long land to put on any time. Let me just read it. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God has given you. Amen? Yeah. The only commandment that mentions honor is the very first one right out of the gate. Uh, and the first thing it says honor is your father. Your earthly father and your heavenly father. Amen. If you want a long, prosperous life, you honor your father and your mother. And this is the one that comes with a promise. The only one that comes with a promise. The only commandment that mentions honor. The only commandment that comes with a promise inside the commandment. That if you do this, what does it say? You'll live long upon the land and, and the Lord your God is giving you. You'll, you'll prosper in that. Amen? 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 But Deuteronomy comes out. Yeah, this is in the Bible. I'm going to show it to you in just a minute. Deuter the book of Deuteronomy comes out and brings the fullness of the first commandment with honor and a promise with it it adds it don't add to the word it is the word brought out and expanded on Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 16 a lot of you didn't even know this was in there the Bible says honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you everybody says that's a commandment that your days may be long and that it may be well with you in the land which the Lord, your God, is giving you. This one brings and defines and brings clarity to the promise of the reward is in two places now. That it will be well with who? When you honor your father and your mother and you operate in that spirit of excellence and honor towards your heavenly father and your earthly parents, it says now you're involved in this and the blessing is going to come to you and the land you're in. Now, leave that verse up there. Leave that verse up there. Let me drop back and read verse 20. Honor your father and mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord God has given you. It says the land God's given you, but it leaves out that you're going to be blessed in the land. Okay? Then we drop down to Deuteronomy. Honor your father and mother as the Lord your God has commanded you that your days may be long and that it may be well with you in the land which the Lord your God has given you. See, God don't want... <laughs> We always, and I thank God for, for the, the inauguration this past week, amen, that yeah. set a record for the number of prayers, yeah. and if you noticed, I think all but two prayers ended in the name of Jesus. Yeah. That's huge, guys, yeah. amen, there was no praying to Alibaba or Sachi Sacha or anything, it was all prayers to the name of Jesus Christ, amen. as it should be. Yeah. Our Vice President, Mike Pence, took the oath of office own the scripture that says if my people will humble themselves and pray and turn from their evil ways that I will hear from heaven and will heal their land Amen. that's what he took his 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 oath of office upon that that's been his main scripture of his life he says and so here that scripture talks about God wants to heal the land we know God wants to heal our land amen yep. but according to the first commandment to, to bring excellence and honor to the father and to our earthly father and mother that we can live long and we will be blessed we will be blessed, let me read it again to you, that your days may be long and that it may be well with you in the land. 
The only way, see, God's not so much into healing the actual doit and stuff. He wants to heal you as you walk in the land, that you possess the land with your anointing and his anointing. See, he's not looking to heal a tree or a desert. or an, He wants to heal it through his ultimate expression of himself in the earth, which is you and me. Excellence and honor brings the reward of a blessed life through you to heal whatever you're around. Touch your neighbor and say, now that's me. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, there's a process to excellence and honor. And write this down real quick. Here's a quick outline of the process. This is just some of the main ones. There's a lot more to it, but these are the main ones. If you want to be a person of excellence and honor, you cannot omit these out of your life. Number one is the Word of God. You will never be an excellent, honorable person to look like Jesus, talk like Jesus, if you don't have the Word of God in you. You cannot, I mean, I'll be honest with you, I would love to think I'm that good, that you could hear me once a week and you could walk in excellence and honor because you heard the Word of God preached. I'm not that good. There ain't never been a man that good. The only way you'll ever walk in the fullness of excellence and honor is if you have a daily companion, a daily desire, a daily hunger to feed on the Word of God every day of your life. Whether it be five minutes, five hours you get to study, as long as it's real, as long as it's impactful, you're looking to learn from Christ, you're looking to walk in His ways, whatever time you get studying that Word, it's going to prosper you. So number one is the Word. Number two is you must have a lifestyle of prayer. Don't expect to walk in excellence and honor as a child of God unless you know how to pray and get in touch and talk and communicate with God. Amen. Touch your neighbor says common sense stuff. And then if you want to walk in the fullness of God and in His presence, you've got to accept all of God. All three parts of God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Amen. Most churches now, we want to operate on the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. We'll take Him as long as He don't do none of that funny stuff. As long as He talks English and not that jibber-jabber, we're okay with Him. But let me tell you something. Study the Bible, the jibber-jabber, what we call the tongues, the gift of tongues is in there, the gift of healing, the gift of interpretations, the gift of prophecy, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge. All that's God. Yeah. The Spirit of excellence. All that's God. So don't neglect the gift of the Holy Spirit in your life. Amen? Amen. Take all of God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen? Amen. And then here's what you've got to do. You've got to take the Word. You've got you to take the Word. You've got to take your prayer life. You've got to take the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, all of heaven in you, and you've got to trust the process. You've got to trust the process. When the process leads you in the lion's den, in the lion's den, you've got to trust the process. When it takes you into the, into the funeral home, you've got to trust the process. When it takes you when you've lost your job, you've got to still trust the process. You don't stop on your word. You don't stop praying. And you don't stop absorbing into your life the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. And you watch Him bring you out of these things through the process and you learn some things. I hate what I had to do this past. Probably the hardest thing I've ever had to do is, is watch my baby go into surgery. Hardest thing I've ever had to do. I don't thank God that it had to happen, but I thank God through it. I've learned some stuff while sitting in that hospital, y'all. So I took the time. I could either sit there and mope in it, or I could say, okay, God, what do you want me to know here? Amen? And so I've come out with some deeper knowledge and deeper revelations of who God is, how he operates, how to be more sensitive to people who are going through that thing. Come on, say amen to that. Amen? Why? Because I went through that. The last few weeks has been another process I've went through. But I want to learn from it and not blame God, but I want to glorify him through it. I know that, make, that sometimes that don't even make sense, does it? Now, I'm going to go into a realm here, and you, y'all just hold on. All of you are not going to be with this right out of the gate. It's okay. But I'm going to talk about Alabama football. Roll Tide. Now, whether or not you're an Alabama fan or an Auburn fan or a Gators fan or even a Texas fan, where you at, man? You cannot deny what Alabama has accomplished since Coach Nick Saban's come on board. It's just, I mean, it's, you can... You know, one of the pop icons I grew up with was Michael, uh, hee hee, uh, Michael Jackson. Yeah. Let me tell you something. If there was ever a freak of a person, he was a freak. Okay? He was a freaky person. But you cannot deny his ability to sing and dance. I mean, for somebody to look at Michael Jackson, well, he can't sing or dance. You're just ignorant. I didn't like him, don't, don't, don't like nothing about what he done, done, what he represented or anything. But again, you look at just the face value of what he could do, it was amazing what he could do, vocal and dance-wise. So whether or not today you're an Alabama fan or not, you cannot look at Alabama's program and say, they ain't been successful at nothing. 
Since he's come there, they have built a championship quality team every year, whether or not they win the title or not. Now, it didn't come just because he showed up. It come because he implemented some things, and he's not changed anything. And he actually calls what he calls it. What does he call it? He calls it the process. Our, our student athletes have to come in here, and they have to buy into the process. Come on, somebody. Amen? Amen? amen. Now, how many of you know that, <laughs> that if you come to Alabama, and they've done got a, a bunch of five stars already on campus, they do every year. They have the number one class every year. Why? Because he has a process that puts people in championship positions and puts more people in the NFL than any other team right now. Now, here comes these jacked up five-star athletes into Alabama, some of them cocky, some of them that, and guess what? If they don't line up to the process, they're gone. Five star, four and five-star players have left Alabama because they could not adapt to the process Coach Saban had. And you know what? He lets them walk. Because he knows if he keeps them and they're not involved in the process, he's going to hinder the other students, athletes. So it's, it's, it's about the process. The process doesn't change for a star athlete. Now listen to me real close. The process of Jesus Christ does not change just because of who you think you are. Well, I'm holy. I've given this much money. I know these many scriptures. I've done this right here in the community. I'm an outstanding person. You can be a five-star outstanding person, but if you don't want to go through the process of Jesus Christ, you can just keep on going. It's not Jesus' design. It's your design. Come on, somebody. Amen? The process doesn't change for the biggest superstar on the earth. They must come. How do you think a, a freshman got to start this year in Alabama? Because he come, he adapted to the process. He said, you're in the process, you're buying in, you're doing what we need you to do. Boom, you're, you're, boom you got it. Yeah. Beat out two other five-star quarterbacks. And by the way, they left. Yeah. And you can't really blame them sometimes, but the process. Amen? Now, think about the, how many know the process at the, at the University of Alabama? Number one, it's hard. It's not easy. Yeah. The process is hard. The process requires work. The process doesn't last this long and then you get to stop and take a break. It's continual the whole time. Come on, somebody. Amen. And the process takes 100% of your effort. If you don't give 100%, you're not going to be in there. The process is not for the weak. Touch your neighbor and say, thank for the weak. The process is not for the weak. But the process will take a weak person. If they stay with it, they get dedicated. The weak will become strong in the process. Because the Bible says, in your weakness, my strength is made perfect. Amen. So it's not about you, but it's about you going through the process. On the high points where you're doing good, and in the low points where people take you, you don't stop being corrected. You don't stop getting direction, and you don't stop getting encouragement from God. Can I have an amen? So real quickly, go ahead and make your way up, guys. I want to show you a video clip. The sound is not the best in the world, but I want to show you about a minute, nine seconds of Coach Saban describing the process. And I want you to see how much... It lines up with the qualities of what we preached on today. Okay? Now, I, I know Nick Saban's got a foul mouth. <laughs> Just watch a little of the sideline views. And I'm not, I'm not heralding him as God, okay? But I'm saying he's tapped into something. Again, the principles will work for anybody. Are you listening to me? The principles will work for anybody. But when you throw the presence of God and a willing heart in it in the church, the whole kingdom of heaven on earth as it is in heaven becomes available to you. Amen. Isn't that what you want? You want heaven on earth, don't you? Yeah. Then you got to be willing to go through the process. So let's go ahead and roll this right quick. Well, the process is really what you have to do day in and day out to be successful. Uh, we try to define, uh, you know, the standard that we want everybody to uh, sort of work toward, adhere to, uh, and do it on a consistent basis uh, and you know the things that I talked about before uh, being responsible for your own self-determination having a positive attitude having great work ethic having discipline uh, to be able to execute on a consistent basis whatever it is you're choosing to do uh, those are the things that we try to focus on uh, and we don't try to focus as much on outcomes as we do on being all that you can be and the things that you need to do to be all you can be uh, eliminate the clutter and all the things that are going on outside and focus on the things that you can control uh, with how you sort of go about and take care of your business and uh, that's something that's ongoing and it can never change and um, you know so it's the process of what it takes to be successful very simply. Amen. Amen. 
Now, you, you may be reeking because you can't stand Alabama. That's okay. But I just want to go back over the words, just real quick hit what he said. The process is what you do, what you have to do day in and day out to be successful. And guys, with God, it's not a Sunday morning splatter my bladder, put a quiver in my liver, oh, I feel good, now I'm going to go out here and struggle. No. It's a taking God that you get in here and taking it out there and expanding it, multiplying it, because you study the Word. You're in prayer daily basis. Amen? You're walking with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's day in and day out. You cannot take a day off from being a Christian. And I've never met a true Christian who wants to take a day off. I even want to take Jesus on vacation with me. Some people like to leave Him at home. He goes on and he says, these words right here, he says, he says, you've got to adhere. He says, we define the standard that we want. God has defined the standard he wants. Can I have an amen? God's defined the standard he wants. And everybody works toward, to, it has, he says, you have to adhere to it and you've got to do it on a consistent basis. Again, you've got to be consistent. You've got to be willing to go through the process. Then he goes on, he says, you've got to be responsible for your own self-determination. Too many times in the church, we want to come in here on Sunday, we want to get puffed up, and then, well, now somebody's got to keep me in the Spirit. If you can't get the Spirit of God to keep you in the Spirit, honey, who do you think anybody else is? Are you listening to me? If the Spirit of God Himself cannot keep you wrapped up in His love, His power, His omnipotence, His om omnipresence, who He is as God the Father, Son, if He can't keep you wrapped up in Him, you think any man or woman's going to? got to depend on him totally and then let the people of God come around and bring that cor correction direction and encouragement are you listening adhere to do it on a consistent basis be responsible for your own self-determination having a positive attitude oh Jesus hallelujah having great work ethics having discipline to be able to execute on a consistent basis and then the last part he closed with this right here well it didn't close it's a lot more to it but Eliminate the clutter. Say that with me. Say, eliminate my clutter. Man, there is clutter in our lives that's keeping us from excellence and honor. There is clutter in our lives that we're allowing to overcome what we need to be doing, what we need to be saying, how we need to be thinking, what we need to be seeing, what we need to be hearing. There's just all this clutter in our lives, everyday life. Well, i got to do this. Well, you know, so-and-so's mad. Well, so-and-so said this. What's going on on social media? He says, eliminate the clutter. Eliminate the clutter. And all the things that are going on outside and focus on the things that you can control with how you go about and take care of your business. I love that. And then again, he says, that's something that is ongoing and can never change. Amen? Everybody say question. Go ahead and stand to your feet. I'm going to ask our prayer team to come up. Now, I'm not asking you to trust Nick Saban's process today, guys, okay? I'm asking you, do you trust God's process enough to follow Him no matter where it leads? Maybe you're in a Daniel moment and you feel like you're in a lion's den. Are you going to trust Him in a lion's den? Maybe you're at a church of Corinth. You're not sure really which religion is right. You've heard this, worship like this, worship like that, worship like this. You're not sure. Can, you, can, can someone bring you correction, direction, and encouragement and you receive all three? Because you know they love you so much that they want to see you walk in the maximum potential God has for your life, your marriage, your family, your job, everything about you. Can you do that? Because when you can, that's when you're going to start operating in excellence and honor. I want you to listen to this. You may, you may need to watch it and go back and write it down. I should have had you write this down before you stood up. It can never become your culture until you become willing to go through the process. It'll never be your culture of Jesus until you go through the Jesus process. The process the Word of God has lined up so greatly for each one of us. And this morning, no matter where you're at, we're fixing to receive this morning's tithes and offerings. We're going to pray for people. And I hope that you come down here and, and you will say to some of these people that are waiting to pray for you, I want to walk in that process. You may come down and say, you know what? I am saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. Man, I get prophecies. I get revelation, word of wisdom, word of knowledge. I'm doing good. I'm a five-star recruit for God. You, and I, I believe there's a lot of five-star recruits in here for God. You may be a four-star or three. You know what? Alabama don't take all five-star. They let a lot of five-stars pass by because they don't feel they'll fit the process. As a matter of fact, he will say this, I'd rather have a, a two-star or even a one-star that I know will fit the process than a five-star that will bring rebellion. 
So that's not a matter. You may, be, you may only feel like a one star, but the process is going to turn you into a superstar with God. Your marriage may be at a one or a two. Maybe it's at a five. But you know what? With God, God don't stop at five. There are six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's, it's infinite and beyond with God. Don't settle for where you're at no matter where you're at. Embrace the process and say, you know what? Even if I'm walking in a good culture, there's a great culture. There's stuff I've still got to learn. There's stuff I've still got to mature through. And there's stuff still God's got to take me through. And I want to make sure that I lock in today and stay with the culture of God. So we're fixing to open up these altars. We're going to pray and receive this morning's tithes and offerings. Do you have a culture of giving? You know, Jesus was a giver. He gave. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, say it with me. He gave. It's his culture to give. Do we have a giving culture as a body of Christ? I'm not just talking about tithes. I'm giving of our time, our talent, our resources. Giving of our encouragement to people. Giving of our willingness to pray with somebody in need and not shy away. Oh, there's so much culture. We could preach on culture the rest of the year. But today, Father, we're going we're gonna to get right down to business. The culture of being willing to go through the process today. No matter if we're doing great or not so good, you love us right where we're at. But again, I always say that you love us too much to leave us where we're at. No matter if we're doing good, greater, there's always better with Christ. There's things coming even this year, Lord, that we're going to walk through that we necessarily may not want to, but the process will get us through it and we'll come out more blessed than ever. And so, Father, we bring you the tithes and the offerings this morning as we're about to take them up. If you're here for the first time, please don't, if you're from another church, please don't give your tithe to Journey Church. It belongs to your church. We just want you to be impacted by the Word of God today. But, Father, as we receive this morning's tithes and offerings, as we give it, may we then make our way forward and say, you know what, I want to process that just honors God. These people are going to pray for you. They're not going to keep you here long. And then we've got to, we're going to just shower Miss Alexa here in just a minute with gifts from above, being generous in that generous spirit. But right now, Father, in the name of Jesus, as we give to you, Lord, we cannot give you. But Lord, let it be our culture to want to match you in everything we do, Father. To be generous, to be loving, to be kind, to be forgiving, to be forgiven, to walk in purity and sanctification and redemptive blood of Jesus, to walk free and to be peaceful and just to, just to breathe and enjoy life again, even though it's going to throw some things at us to know. You know what? God's got this. God knows how to shut the mouth of a lion. He knows how to bring a church from false idols into the true worship of God. He loves me enough. If he, Lord, if you love me, correct me, God. If you love me, God, give me direction. And because you love me, God, you give me encouragement. Lord, I want more of this process in my life because I don't want to let you down one single time in any part of my day, my actions, my attitude. For your glory, in Jesus' name.